Remember in your textbooks it shows uh, smaller horses growing into larger horses? And that's supposed to be the norm from evolution as years go by. You get a little small horse and all of a sudden they have bigger horses now. It's actually often in the reverse. And that's almost the reverse of thumb. So I don't know. They haven't changed that, yet we have all kinds of anomalies in this situation. It has more to do with uh, the fact that the larger horse is going to find a way to escape the flood waters and be drowned later, so he's going to be latest in the rock strata. And we considered then uh, later in time than the smaller horses, but the smaller horses drowned because they couldn't escape the water. They couldn't, they weren't big enough bodily enough to, to climb up mountains or st and stuff like that. So, anyway, let's look at K35 and continue with that. Increase in body size, that's the whole issue. Uh, paleontologist Simpson says, increase in body size is very common. I'm going to make this a little bigger. A stock example being the change from Eohippus, Eohippus to the modern horse. The phenomenon is perhaps sufficiently usual to be a rule, but the rule has many exceptions. This is what he says. Even in the horse family, several evolving lines have become smaller rather than larger. The apparent extent of this rule has been exaggerated by students who thought it absolute and who insisted that because an earlier animal was larger than a later relative, therefore it was not ancestral to the latter. Whatever may be the actual field evidence of increasing size with the increasing elevation in the strata, they can once again be most easily explained in terms of greater mobility of the larger, stronger animals, and therefore their generally greater ability to retreat from the rising floodwaters and to escape, escape being caught in the swollen streams and rushing downward from the hills. There would be many exceptions to this, of course, and that is just what the rock strata tend to show, according to Simpson. A later flow of uh, flood water can come back and leave an entirely different set of, of uh, drowned life forms and uh, would completely mess up the whole order. That's why we have repetition sometimes with the same life form going before and after and after and before. More commonly, however, the various animals in the series, and even the most, the classics horse series contains only a relatively small number of distinct forms with little indication of any sort of gradual change between forms and are not found supposed superposed in the strata at any one location or adjacent locations, but rather are found on the surface at scattered points around the world with a phylogenetic series then being constructed mainly on the basis of evolutionary presuppositions as to the possible relationships between these various creatures. This, the series thus constructed is thereupon submitted as proof positive for the evolution of the modern horse. To whatever extent Cope's law may have applied during the formation of the Philosopherist strata, it appears that its trend is now reversed. Practically all modern plants and animals, including man, are represented in the past in the fossil record by larger specimens than are now living. Giant beaver, saber-toothed tiger, mammoth, cave bear, giant bison, dinosaurs, you know, a lot, lot bigger than the dinosaurs, the, the lizards we have today. Living fossils, almost equally anomalous to examples of fossils of man existing in ancient deposits before he was supposed to have existed, are the many instances of supposedly ancient and long extinct creatures which have suddenly and unexpectedly turned up living in the modern world. An example of this is the odd creature known as the T-U-A-T-A-R, Tuatera, Tuatera, which now lives only in New Zealand. It is the sole living representative of that older order of reptiles known as the beakheads. The remarkable thing is that a creature which is so apparently out of place in the modern world which has apparently little selection value in the struggle for existence, could have survived the countless vicissitudes of the millions of years that are supposed to have elapsed since all re its relatives perished. A few thousand years of survival under adverse circumstances might be possible, but hardly millions. Despite the present-day existence of this Tuatera, not one bone is identified as that of the beakhead, 
that has been discovered in the rocks laid down since the supposed early Cretaceous period, some 135 million years ago. So, Charles Bogert, Tartera, is why is it a lone survivor? Scientific Monthly. Let's see what he has to say. This is a true living fossil, the sole survivor of the reptilian order of meekheads, which otherwise became extinct some 135 million years ago, according to the standard evolutionary time scale. Fossils of these creatures are found in supposed Cretaceous and older rocks, but none whatsoever in a more recent strata. Now they're living. They are still remaining, still living on the, in the modern world. And the Tuatera, Tuatera is only one of numerous examples of such living fossils. It is strange that no one remains, no one, no remains of this creature have been found in the rocks representing this 135 million year gap, if a gap actually exists. The skeleton of a reptile found in the Jurassic deposits of Europe is so nearly identical with that of the living Tuatera that very little change in that bony structure must have taken place during a period of 150 million years. So much for natural selection. So Bogart goes on to say, another recent discovery quite amazing to the evolutionists was that of the coelanth, a supposedly long extinct fish whose fossils, my shoe on here, whose fossils are abundant in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic strata. The Harvard paleontologist, Dr. Romer, remarks concerning this discovery. The co let's see, coelacanths are a marine offshoot of the Crossopatero G or something, a group essentially essential to ascend ancestral to land vertebrates and hence of evolutionary importance. Typical Crossopterogens have been extinct since the Paleozoic. The fossil record of the Colocanths extends to the Cretaceous some 70 million years ago, and then it stops. In consequence, I, like many other, uh, another lecturer, used to tell my class emphatically that there are no living crossoterogens. And I can well remember my amazement in the winter of 1939 at seeing in the London Illustrated News a photograph of a living, or rather recently living, colocanth. A.S. Romer, in his review, The Search Beneath the Sea, so we get down there, down beneath the sea, even more remarkable than the discovery of the colocanth was the recent dredging up of several specimens, specimens of a living segmented mollusk at a depth of 11,700 feet in the Acapulco Trench off Central America, representing a primitive type that supposedly became extinct in the Devonian period. The biologist, biologist Bentley Glass, reporting in this find, says, to zoologists, the recently reported discovery by the Galathea expedition of the extraordinary deep-sea mollusk Neopilina galathea will seem even more incredible than the famous discovery in recent times of Latimeria, the living colocanth. The newfound mollusk represents a class that existed in the Cambrian to Devon Devonian periods of the Paleozoic and was, was supposed to have become extinct about 280 million years ago. Wow. 280 million is a long time. And one cannot help but wonder what it, about its reality. Fossils of this class of mollusk were apparently plentiful in the early Paleozoic strata, and it is amazing that none have been found in the marine strata of the Mesozoic, Mesozoic and Tertiary. If indeed these actually represent the hundreds of millions of years following the Paleozoic that they are supposed to uh, supposed to existed. Harry Ladd. <clears throat> in the same year that the colocanth was caught in fairly deep water, a series of primitive crustaceans was found inhabiting the interstitial waters of beach sands in New England. It was regarded as the most primitive living crustacean yet discovered. It held this significant position only until 1953, at which time still more primitive crustacean was dredged from the mud beneath the shallow waters on Long Island Sound. Its closest known relative, Lepidocaris, lived in Middle Devonian time some 300 million years ago. In view of these, 
Harnag goes on to say, and many similar discoveries, one also wonders whether or not many of the supposedly extinct creatures of geologic history might not also be living in some unexplored region of the globe, especially in the deep oceans. It would not be surprising if even the, the famous trilobite, perhaps the most important index file of the earliest period of the Paleozoic, the Cambrian, would, should, should turn up in one of these days. A creature very similar to it has already been found. A specimen of a living fossil, perhaps the most primitive extant member of one of the major classes of animals, has recently been added to, to the collections of the Smithsonian Institution. This is a crustacean that has certain character, characters of the long extinct trilobites, the Earth's dominant animals of a half a billion years ago, fossils of which are among the earliest traces of a high order of life on this planet. Presumable, it is exclusively, and presumably it is exclusively an inhabitant of the mud bottoms of shallow inshore waters and never comes to the surface or has free swimming existence. This may account for the fact that it has remained unknown for so long. Living fossils resembles the long extinct trilobite, Science Digest. In the plant kingdom, it has not been many years since quite a sensation was created among paleobotanists by the discovery of living specimens of the tree Mesocoya in a remote region of China. The conifer genius Metasequoia was widely distributed over the northern hemisphere in past ages. Its fossil remains have been found in Alaska, Greenland, Spitsbergen, and northern Siberia in rocks of Eocene age, 60 million years old, in rocks of Miocene age, 30 million, and in Oregon and California, Germany, and Switzerland, Manchuria, and Japan. It was considered to have become extinct some 20 million years ago since its fossil remains did not occur in rocks younger than Miocene. We've got examples of this over and over again. Ralph Cheney. Cheney, who was a paleobotanist at the University of California and who made an expedition to study the trees, proceeds to tell about one which was nearly 100 feet high and one stand of over 100 of these trees. Still thriving. Evidently, something must have been wrong with a geological record deduced from the Pleiocene and Pleistocene strata, which failed to reveal the continued existence of the trees in spite of the great abundance of the, in the supposedly earlier strata. So now we have a summary of these fossils that we can conclude. The principle of uniformitarianism is utterly inadequate to account for the far greater part of the geologic pharma phenomena. Too many exceptions. The most important geologic processes are those of erosion, deposition, glaciation, diastrophism, diastrophism, crust deformations such as caused by earthquakes and other earth movements forming continents, ocean basins, plateaus, mountains, and so on, and volcanism. Each of these important processes, without exception, must at some time or times in the past have acted with tremendously greater intensity than anything measured today. Present-day volcanic activity is not only quantitatively but qualitatively different from the volcanic phenomena of the geologic past that have produced the great dikes and sills, the bathyless great subterranean mass of intruding igne igneous rocks, and lacoliths, great masses of intruding igneous rocks causing a, a bulge, bulges in the Earth's crust, as well as great lava fields and plateaus of the world, one of which covers an area of 300,000 square miles in South America. Similarly, modern diastrophic Activities such as the earthquake is of apparently an entirely different order of magnitude from the tremendous earth movements of the past. The origin of the great mountain chains, which apparently have been uplifted from the sea bottom in the most recent geologic periods, is still a mystery. One simple small local earthquake, not going to do it. No satisfactory and generally accepted theory of origine, origine mountains forming, has yet been devised either, which in fact itself proves that modern diastrophic processes do not explain those of the Earth's earlier history. Not only in present rates of glaciation immensely milder than in the past, but also in the present processes have been quite unable to account for these past increases in glacial activity. This also is evidenced by the fact that no satisfactory glacial theory has yet been propounded, although numerous attempts have been made. The most important geologic processes is sedimentation, including both erosion and deposition. 
The very basis of historical geology is the supposed sequence of the sedimentary rocks and their contained fossils.